time for us to begin our final session. And we all know that we are what stands between you and having a life. So um, we will try to be brilliant and expeditious and also give you all time to say your thoughts and ask your questions. Um, I'm Ann Okerson. I'm one of the Associate University Librarians for the Yale Library System. Um, I don't have an iPhone up front. I don't even have an iPhone. Um, I don't have a birth date today, but I do have one qualification that makes me uniquely poised to moderate this session, and that is that my office is across the street at Sterling Library, and I look over the entrance to the law school every day. So I, th I think that entitles me to something. Um, I frequently argue that future libraries are not going to be simple, functional extensions of print, nor will they be completely alien, incomprehensible, or miraculous entities. I think electronic information and libraries will be a seat of rich and often unpredictable potentials, even as we retain some resemblances to the past. We are given a dramatic and powerful transition to live through. Life comes with very few guarantees, and we have no assurances that libraries or librarians will survive the information revolution in the forms that we know them now. But if we know who we are, and we know who we believe, then a world of opportunities will give us a chance to achieve great marvels. This is what I believe. Or in the words of a country and western songwriter, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. So now to this session, which is uh, inspired at least to some probably large extent by Google's mass digitizing program and the fallout from it, uh, we're going to hear a fair amount of discussion around and pertaining to that settlement. So just what is it? Well, uh, one of the things it is is 300 pages long. Uh, it resembles Ann Walpert's uh, PowerPoint elephant of this morning. I think it kind of depends on the day, and it certainly depends on who's having the conversation in a particular context. Uh, NYU's law school professor James Grimmelman wrote an article in the April 2009 issue of the Journal of Internet Law. It was called How to Fix the Google Settlement. And he writes, his very opening words are, the project will be immensely good for society, a fair one for Google authors and publishers. However, public interest demands that the settlement first be modified. There's a piece in this morning New York's, morning's New York Times which reviews uh, very quickly, as a news article will, uh, the good sides and the bad sides of the settlement. And of course, some of the bad sides uh, that are described by those opposed to the settlement are that it could tie up a very important body of information, privatize it, and over time, perhaps, as Robert Darton from Harvard says, uh, make it totally unaffordable. Um, I think those may be some extreme views, but they're interesting views and they need to be reckoned with. So we have four speakers this afternoon. Uh, we are going to do as our bosses in the ISP project have instructed. We will hear from two of them. We will take a break for comments and questions from the audience, and we will conclude with the uh, remaining two. So our first speaker is going to be Jeffrey Kennard, who is managing partner of the Washington DC office of Debe Voice. Do I have that right? I practiced that. And Plimpton LLP, he practices in areas of intellectual property. Uh, he serves as counsel to the publishers and the publisher subclass in the Google book search litigation. And he is going to talk about his perspectives from that role. Our second speaker will be Guy Pesich, who is, he said, skip the introductions, I want the extra 30 seconds for my talk, so I will simply tell you that he is at the Hebrew University. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, for the introduction. Thanks to Yale Law School and the ISP for inviting me back to my alma mater. Um, I enjoy coming back, but I've actually never had this vantage point in this auditorium, having always been uh, somewhere out there. I have been asked to talk about the Google Book Search Settlement, 
uh, from the standpoint of the authors and uh, the publishers. Uh, that's not surprisingly because my firm represents uh, the five publishers who brought suit against uh, Google in the fall of 2005 and now the publisher subclass uh, which is participating in the uh, class action uh, settlement. Let me give you um, a bit of background but before I do that um, it won't surprise you to know that I'm uh, enthusiastically supportive of the settlement and that's true uh, of course of my my clients. Uh, as Jonathan uh, mentioned, the Google book search uh, cases were brought uh, because Google was scanning millions and millions of books uh, from libraries uh, and displaying snippets of those books uh, without permission. Uh, snippets are short three or four lines of text uh, displayed in response to a user's search request. And famously, Google argued, of course, that no permission was required uh, for this activity because this was a fair use under the Copyright Act. And the publishers and the authors uh, disagreed with that view. Uh, the libraries who um, produced the books for Google to uh, scan and then received back uh, library digital copies uh, in return for their participation in the scanning project uh, were, not a, were not sued uh, by either the authors uh, or the publishers. Uh, the authors and the publishers essentially objected uh, to the principle that you could copy first uh, without obtaining the permission of the copyright owner. Their view was that that uh, turned uh, co basic copyright principles on its uh, head, felt that Google should have asked for, display, uh, for permission before scanning and display. Google, of course, said, well, that's not necessary uh, because what we're doing is perfectly uh, lawful. Um, and in addition, uh, Google and its supporters pointed out that with respect to a massive scanning project of this sort, one which many libraries uh, would have um, considered as well, it's impossible to get the permission of every single uh, person who has a copyright in a book being uh, scanned, particularly for books that are out of print. So the legal issue uh, before the court was whether this digitization and display of snippets uh, was or wasn't a fair use, and both sides uh, thought that they had uh, a strong position. The litigation would have been protracted uh, in the district court, and then uh, the side that lost presumably would have taken the matter to the Court of Appeals, and then ultimately it could have been taken all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, if the litigation had been pursued in this way, it would have resolved only that question of whether or not digitization and display of snippets snippets was a fair use. That might have been the granddaddy of all uh, fair use cases, but we don't uh, know uh, because we now have a settlement. The parties essentially concluded that a better, broader uh, deal could be struck than any result that could be achieved in litigation. And over many, many months, the parties discussed uh, what would be the shape of that deal and then ultimately memorialized the settlement in the document that uh, you're familiar with and maybe some of you have, have, have read. Uh, so why did the authors and the publishers decide to settle? Um, and I'm just going to uh, tick through uh, essentially the major reasons. Uh, first, it's a way of allowing readers in the United States to find and access whole books, not just snippets, in a meaningful way. Um, snippets are useful to some, but ultimately might be frustrating uh, because it's only a very small portion of the book that you can see. And the settlement uh, particularly is useful for making out-of-print uh, books accessible to readers in the United States. The settlement broadly distinguishes between out-of-print books and in-print books. The default for out-of-print books is that they can be displayed uh, by Google and made available through various revenue models unless the rights holders tell Google not to do so. Uh, the default for in-print books is that Google can't display any of the content of the in-print books unless uh, the rights holder comes forward and authorizes uh, Google to do so. But the idea is that uh, it breathes new commercial life into these out-of-print books, many of which can only be found on the shelves of uh, some major research libraries uh, here in the United States. Further, the settlement allows for an authorization-based scheme. Through the class action mechanism, the rights holders are authorizing Google to uh, display books, to index books, 
to make internal research uses of books and essentially to scan books. And that this uh, scheme of authorization through the class action mechanism is consistent with the uh, copyright owner's view. Um, and it is, to be sure, very difficult uh, in any other context other than a class action to get rights from this large body of rights holders, particularly of out of print books. Uh, further, the settlement provides new revenue models or methods for making these books available. Uh, essentially, as I say, injecting commercial life into the books. And the, essentially, the, th there are three business models. The first is that consumers can purchase access to a book online from any uh, computer connected to the internet in the United States. Second, that there are institutional subscriptions in which institutions such as this university can buy access to the entire uh, corpus of books and make uh, those books available to students, uh, faculty, researchers, and others. There's an advertising-based model, and then there are other display uses that Google can make, such as preview use. That is to say that anyone can see probably up to 20% of a book uh, for free based on their search terms. And then there are further business models that the settlement contemplates but are not yet approved at this time, such as uh, PDF download and print on demand and so forth. Uh, all of these revenue models contemplate a 63-37 split, 63% to the rights holder and 37% to Google. That was considered and is considered to be a very favorable um, revenue split from the content owner's standpoint. The settlement also allows users uh, to make certain uses of books. Um, when authorized. So for example, books can be annotated and then the annotations can be shared amongst other purchasers of a book or amongst people in a classroom setting. People can cut and paste from these books. They can print out the entirety of the books. The books are not subject to DRM. The settlement also contemplates the establishment of a registry. Uh, there are registries today, for example, the CCC in the uh, publishing uh, industry, but other uh, industries, other content industries have robust uh, registries. Um, ASCAP and BMI were mentioned earlier today, and it was thought that the registry essentially uh, established um, out of the settlement funds uh, would be a very useful thing for rights holders, authors, and publishers uh, to have. And the function of the registry is to uh, go and find rights holders, retain funds received from uh, Google and then ultimately pay those funds to the rights holders. Um, often overlooked but extremely important is that the settlement addresses and finally deals with the vexing problem of who owns the electronic rights in these books, authors or publishers. Authors view was if we've not granted the electronic rights, we retain the rights and so Google has to come to us. Publisher's view was, well, it's the publisher's book that's being scanned, so the publisher has a stake uh, in those books as well. And the settlement essentially avoids the question of having to go to each contract and look at it on a contract by contract basis to determine who has the rights by saying both have rights in the books except for books that are reverted where only the author has the rights and books where, that are work for hire where only the publishers have the right. At any time, an author or a publisher can exclude a use or remove the book uh, from the database. So it gives the content owner uh, the control uh, that they were seeking in the, legis in the litigation. And there are other ancillary benefits. It may uh, inculcate, create, assist in the notion that you read a book online, or at least you're able to read books online, which would be complementary to reading, uh, in many cases, the hard copy of the book. Um, Books will be available in libraries through the public access service, a terminal that will be available to read this entire corpus of books uh, online. The database will be accessible to anyone in the United States who has an internet connection. Google agrees to make books available to the visually impaired. I mean, all of these are complementary to the digital rights efforts that the publishers are, themselves are making to essentially uh, make it possible for people to come to publishers' own websites and get digital copies of books. Um, the authors and publishers, of course, have some views on how all of this affects libraries because libraries that are participating in this uh, may get back library digital copies, the LDCs that Jonathan Zittrain referred to this morning. Uh, and the libraries were at the table. Um, the libraries were represented by a lawyer. 
there were, uh, there's a significant amount of interaction with the libraries from the start to the finish of, of the settlement. And the settlement contains a number of provisions that explain what the libraries uh, can do with their LDCs. There were some choices to be made. It was possible to design a system uh, in which the library's uses of the LDC was left entirely up to fair use. But uh, the settlement, in fact, rep <clears throat> reflects a series of rights and obligations that clearly state what a, a library uh, can and can't do with its LDC. And there's quite a lot. They can make replacement copies. They can use snippets and finding tools. They can provide access to the visually impaired from the LDC. They can allow for so-called non-consumptive research um, of the entire uh, LDC. Researchers can come and do data mining and the like. There are classroom and research uses that are permitted for books that uh, aren't available in the institutional uh, subscription. There's some reference made to these security standards uh, by Jonathan Zittrain this morning. These were designed with major libraries in mind. They don't really require universities to do anything else other than the, what they ordinarily do to protect uh, information that's residing on their uh, servers. Um, and so I won't speak to the public interest uh, by way of conclusion because I think we have a whole panel here who will uh, do just that and we have all of you in the audience. But I think the authors and the publishers do believe that the settlement is uh, very much in the public interest and well and not the least of which it's uh, providing the opportunity for uh, readers in the United States to find uh, access and read millions and millions of books uh, which they never could do uh, before. So I'll leave it at that other than uh, to say that we're very supportive of the settlement, quite enthusiastic about it, and we look forward to it getting approved by uh, the court. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. This has been really a fascinating event. Not much, much left to be said. I was asked to say a few words about the issue of digital archives in Europe, and I will do so and then maybe go on to some more general normative arguments. So uh, if we look at Europe, the basic thing that we see is something which is quite different than the strong commercial <coughs> privatized elements that characterize the U.S. scene with the, the prominent example of Google Library and the library settlement. In Europe, there is much more focus on public provision of digitized cultural preservation. And I'll give you just uh, two examples to begin with. One example, relatively minor, yet I think it's important because it provides a different model, would be the digital images collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. The museum provides over half a million images through its website free of charge, including in the format of high resolution images for personal and educational purposes. Any book with less than 4,000 hard copies would be regarded as an educational use. use. Those uses do not require permission or payment of royalties. The second example, which is much more pretentious in its scale and scope, is the Europeana project just browse europeana.eu. It's a project of the European Union. It includes a search platform to a collection of European digital libraries with paintings, books, films, and audio materials. It's quite a huge project, at least in European terms. 27 member states, more than uh, 1,000 participating institutions, I think something like more than half a million items. And the basic structure is that each institution hosts its own content separately, but then the content is connected to the Europeana portal. Up till now, I think it sounds very exciting. The only problem is that all users are restricted and subordinated to the IP rights of both originating copyright owners and uh, the rights of the Europeana uh, project managers. Now, there are two main differences between US legal regime and European legal regime that should be emphasized at this stage. First of all, Europe recognizes a wide generous database right. 
including in databases of public domain materials. In other words, if Booster would uh, put up his project in Europe, he would own a, a database right in the whole internet archives. The second point is that, at least in some European countries, uh, for example, the UK digital images of public domain materials may also be protected by an independent copyright. In American terms, the legacy of FICE does not uh, apply in Europe. What else is worth mentioning about the Europeana project? Well, for one thing, not, ev not everyone can co contribute materials to the project. Only certified public cultural institutions can. So this is not a democratic project. The second point is that the whole project is based on the establishment of licensing schemes with rights owners. And this leads me to the following point. Moving toward legal policy in the European Union, well, if you go over the uh, reform proposals that the European Commission uh, is uh, proposing, the general approach is not uh, to come up with new uh, legislative reforms in the area of copyright, but rather suffice with uh, structural institutional licensing schemes between major institutions and uh, copyright owners and then their representative organizations. I think it's something like what Google did with the authors and publishers. So when someone tries to compare the US approach, the US direction to the European direction, I think that we can argue that we come up with something which is similar to what happened in the early days of radio and uh, television. Whereas Europe followed a model of public provision, the US has taken a model which is mostly commercial and privatized with Google settlement as I think the main example. But what is still common both to the US and Europe is the fact that large scale projects are all based on contractual licensing regimes. It could be Google, it could be the EU, but there's still a concentration around licensing regimes that practically replace and block any hope for uh, legal reforms. In both cases, those mega licensing structure tend to impose significant barriers of entry to anyone who is not Google or the European Union. So instead of leading the required reforms in copyright law, what we are witnessing is some maneuvers by major players that basically leverage copyright law to the to, to their dominant position. Now, I think that these directions have some uh, worries to think upon, and here I'm going back to the media analogy because digital archives have major social walls which are quite parallel to the ones of media uh, entities, both of them shape our views, ideologies, and perceptions. And if we go back to the history of media regulation, uh, we can come up with some presumption that a concentrated map of commercial and even public digital archives would not be enough to follow the goals of a democratic culture. Uh, instead, we need something which is much more of a hybrid, mixed system that comes up with a mechanism of checks and balances that encourages different types of preservation organizations. Now, I must admit that all through, uh, I think all through the day, and especially when people discuss the Google Library project, there's some sense that the element of comprehensiveness, this vision of a one-stop digital library for all the books in the world is something which is very desirable, but to some degree it has become some sort of a double-edged sword because we became so fascinated with this idea that we tend to neglect other options uh, which may be no less important uh, for cultural preservation. Now, the question still remains, where do we go from here? So, hypothetically, the best place to go would be some copyright reforms that would come up with solutions that 
uh, better enable uh, a more diversified landscape of cultural preservation institutions. A proposal such as a compulsory licensing scheme from, for the establishment and the provision of public access to uh, digital collections. A, a broader interpretation of the fair use defense, just something like Jonathan spoke about in the uh, previous panel. I think that Frank maybe will mention something about a new version of the deposit requirement that deals with digital copies, so I won't speak about it, but as a practical matter, I think that there are very small chances that such uh, directions will be taken either in the US or in Europe uh, if you go back to the European uh, Union, there is a recent green paper that deals with uh, new proposed exemptions and limitations to the European Copyright Directive, but eventually, if you read this green paper quite carefully, uh, you find, up, find out that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the approach of the European Commission is to uh, go to a contractual pet, uh, regulate orphan works, regulate exemptions and limitation to preservation only through uh, those institutional uh, agreements with copyright owners. Uh, another option which I think should be raised and dealt with, and I think that uh, the ISP here at Yale has been doing some research in this direction, is to think about new directions to incorporate uh, free speech theory uh, into uh, the evaluation of uh, the settlement agreement, for example. And my pro basic proposal in this direction is that we need to think in, of free speech not only through the contemporary prism, but also through an internet generational uh, perspective. In other words, uh, free speech considerations should come up uh, as a main consideration in uh, uh, digital preservation uh, debates uh, while thinking about the rights of future generation to be exposed to a diverse range of opinions and materials from the past as well as the uh, free speech right of contemporary speakers to have their imprint on the landscape of history for future generations. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, this is your chance to start asking questions. And I see somebody coming forward. Uh, this is for Jeff, but if other people want to offer an opinion on it. I, I wonder if you can uh, offer any comparison between uh, the Google book search case and the uh, Kindle text-to-speech uh, feature uh, that, that uh, Amazon has now, uh, I guess, offered an opt-out to, to people who want that feature to be disabled for their particular book. But of course, an opt-out was not sufficient to mollify the authors and the publishers in the, in the Google case. Uh, and I wonder what you think sort of the relative strength of, of the claim that that's an infringing uh, activity is. Well, I, I can't speak really too much to the Kindle uh, situation really at all. I mean, I think one difference is that uh, I guess Kindle is uh, distributing books uh, with the permission of copyright owners, publishers, uh, and ultimately um, authors. Uh, and in the case of the Google Book Search project, there are millions of books being copied and there's no privity or contractual relationship between the copyright owner and, and, uh, and Google. Uh, Kindle um, is an, uh, a product, and so presumably Kindle would have made some arguments with respect to the capabilities of that uh, feature and uh, whether it was capable of commercially significant uh, non-infringing uses uh, in defending itself had it been, had it been sued. Uh, that issue, uh, might have been raised in the in the Google uh, book search case, but the principal issue was a core question of whether or not uh, scanning and display was uh, a fair use. There could have been some fair use issues raised in the context of the 
Kindle uh, text-to-speech um, feature, but I think as Jonathan pointed out, fair use is highly fact-specific, and so it's quite different, I think, to uh, say that one was a fair use and the other might not be. It's, it's hard, really, to, I think, draw too many meaningful comparisons. This question is also for, for Mr. Cunard. Um, I was wondering, uh, in the settlement provisions as, as they currently stand, there's a most favored nation clause that doesn't allow any other uh, potential entrants into this digitization market to get bet more favorable terms than Google. I'm wondering first, how do you think that may affect the ability of others to compete in this book digitization market? And second, to what extent do the publishers and you as a representative of the publishers contemplate further entrance into this market, or did you kind of see it as something that would primarily be dominated by Google from the outset in terms of this mass book digitization? Uh, both, both excellent questions. Maybe I can start with the uh, second question um, first. Um, I think we've always contemplated that the licenses here are non-exclusive. Um, they're non-exclusive in the sense that uh, a rights holder can uh, withdraw uh, from the settlement uh, at the opt-out stage. A rights holder can also turn off the uses of its books. Rights holder is not precluded from doing separate deals with its books um, uh, with any other uh, <coughs> licensee, technology company, a library, or what have you. Uh, similarly, the registry um, and the settlement agreement makes this clear, is not precluded from doing deals uh, with anyone else, although the uh, somewhat challenging question is how the registry would get the rights from non-claiming rights holders in order to license a uh, comparable service to a competitor of Google. Uh, that takes me, though, to the, the first question and the MFN provision, which I think is uh, not uh, fully understood uh, by, by many. The MFN provision only applies if uh, the registry or a similar entity can find a way of licensing a, another party um, rights from a substantial portion of the rights holders who have not come forward and claimed with the registry. In other words, let's say there are uh, 20 million rights holders in the world and a million come forward and uh, <clears throat> claim. Uh, that leaves 19 million left. Uh, Google, under this settlement, has the rights from all 20 million. The MFN provision only applies if the registry is licensing a substantial portion of the rights of those 19 million other rights holders to um, a third party. And that's a very difficult um, scenario to imagine, absent uh, really another class action lawsuit or something comparable to what's happened here. Otherwise, the MFN provision does not apply. Um, I, I have a question for Jeff and any of the rest of you who want to take a shot at it. Uh, we heard from others earlier, such as Kenny Cruz, that copyright and communications, scholarly communications, are increasingly global and international. How far away are we from having this kind of access outside of the United States? Because that's all we're talking about at this point in the settlement. What, what would it take to, you know, to, to get access if you're in other countries? I mean, I'll, let, I'll let others answer it, uh, but the settlement only deals with U.S. copyright interests, so only the rights of copyright owners in the United States. Google, under the settlement, is only authorized uh, to make uses, including display uses of the books in the United States, but it is not prohibited from uh, making uses outside the United States. So if Google wishes to scan books outside the United States, display books outside of the United States, uh, Google uh, in our view, has to get uh, permission to do that. Google may believe that it has rights uh, under foreign equivalents of fair use to display uh, snippets, uh, but fundamentally, this settlement only deals with the four corners of the United States, and I think it would be up to Google to try to figure out how to uh, bring about an analogous result elsewhere. 